No? Wow. Okay. Um, Justin Cronin is a graduate from the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop, an associate professor at LaSalle University, and he is a father and husband to his family back in Philadelphia. He's written two books. The first, A Short History of the Long Ball, which was published in 1990. And his second, Marion O'Neill, published in the winter of 2001. Uh, Marion O'Neill is, without a doubt, a testament to this writer's great talent. Um, as he fuses a cycle of short stories into a coherent, unified, hybrid form of the traditional novel. It has garnered him almost instantaneous recognition and admiration from both readers and critics alike. And for his efforts, he was awarded the Penn Hemingway Award for debut fiction this year. Um, a close friend of Colgate University, uh, Professor Fred Bush, a writer whom all of you I'm sure have known, said this of uh, Justin Cronin. He writes beautiful prose that aches with its sense of passing time. He understands youth and he writes with clarity of age. He evokes with precision the glories of the senses. He was born to tell so stories and he narrates his characters with penetrating wit as well as loyalty. His book has left me gasping with admiration, with appreciation, and of course with envy. Ladies and gentlemen, Justin Cronin. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be obedient to the microphone. Gasping. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to read a story uh, that is a Marion O'Neill story that is not in the book. Those of you who know the book might sense that there's uh, a sort of a gap in the narrative, which I, I, I allowed for a number of reasons. Um, there's no story about their courtship. And... Uh, which was fine at the time, but it started bothering me after the book was published, so I wrote one this winter. Um, and it is called Tribe. O'Neill did not like funerals, but who did? O'Neill loved Mary, and because he loved her, he agreed to travel with her to Minnesota, where her family lived, to wait for her grandmother to die. This happened in June, the June of his 29th year. Mary's grandmother was known as Fat Hilda, and she had been dying as long as O'Neill had known of her. True for everyone, O'Neill supposed, though more true for Fat Hilda, who was 86 years old. O'Neill and Mary had just become engaged, and this, too, was part of the inspiration for their journey. O'Neill was long-limbed, thrifty, and well-read, with forgetful blue eyes and a slightly secretive manner. He liked sex, novels set in Italy, crossword puzzles, the changing seasons. Every morning he ran five miles and to that extent might have been described as a creature of habits. His job teaching English at a country day school outside Philadelphia was the correct one for him and he planned to do it many years. O'Neill was not passionate about teaching. He had in fact taken his position sight unseen over the telephone, but he had seen such teachers come and go. They waved their arms and spoke in Latin aphorisms. They covered their blackboards with the evidence of their devotion and high-mindedness. They graded papers long into the night, but what did these things get them? The ones who persevered, O'Neill had found, were those who, like him, were content to make a little difference here and there and then skedaddle on home to watch a movie on the VCR or cook a nice meal like people with any other kind of job. His students were smart and spoiled, with good bone structures and vacation condos in Aspen and the Keys. And if they thought O'Neill foolish for doing a difficult job for almost no money, he never heard about it. <laughs> this period of his life, with its qualities of moderation and quiet utility, had been enhanced by Mary Olson. Mary taught in the French department and was 27. Unlike O'Neill, who had the one sister, Mary came from a large family in both senses. Mary herself was a tiny woman, just five foot two and slender boned, and whenever O'Neill put his arms around her, the love he felt for her was increased by an appreciation for the delicacy of nature's creation. 
For this reason, when O'Neill had first met Perry, Mary's parents on a trip they had taken to visit her in Philadelphia, he could not have been more surprised. <laughs> How could this delicate bird of a woman, a gifted ironist who spoke four languages and read Lacan on her lunch breaks, <laughs> have sprung from the same soil as these enormous sentimental Scandinavians who drove huge American sedans and collected butter churns at flea markets. <laughs> He thought perhaps she had been adopted, but this was not so. These were her people. <laughs> Except for Mary, all the Olsons still lived in Minnesota in towns with the same names as failed cities in upstate, upstate New York. <laughs> not a few, Mary had reported, actually farmed. O'Neill, whose parents, a lawyer and librarian, had subscribed to the New York Review of Books and had taken into him into Manhattan every December to see the Christmas show at Radio City and pick out a toy at FAO Schwartz, did not know what to make of Mary's family. <laughs> Everything about them seemed to move in a kind of cheerful slow motion, like circus elephants. <laughs> the impending death of Fat Hilda was another example of this. Her death could come at any moment or not for weeks or months. She had been at death's door so long, Mary said, it was as if she were camped out for concert tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and who knew when she would get in to see the show? <laughs> they flew to Minneapolis on a warm Wednesday and arrived to learn that Hilda had slipped into a coma. Mary's father met them at the airport and reported this news to them while they drank a beer by, at, at a bar by their gate. Lars Olson sold advertising for a syndicate of Christian country and Western radio stations and was, like all of his clan, a man of few but genial words. He greeted O'Neill, as always, with a humid hug before hoisting himself onto a bar stool. <laughs> Lars explained the situation with Hilda and asked them about the house they were hoping to buy. Mary had brought a photo with her and she produced this from her handbag and showed it to her father. The house, a gingerbread Victorian cottage, was owned by a retired dermatologist and his wife and was in awful shape. Look at those trees, Lars marveled, examining the real realtor's photo. He had pushed his glasses up onto his forehead and tipped the photo first into and then away from the light. Are those all yours? Well, not yet, Mary explained. The lot is pretty big, though. You can't tell from the picture, but there's a room on the second floor that's actually round. Lars paused to admire Mary's engagement ring, a single rose-colored diamond set in platinum. I'd say you kids have got your work cut out for you, Lars said. This is a special time. Enjoy it. <laughs> they finished their be beers and drove 40 minutes to Mary's parents' house. Lars and Gretchen lived in the same house they always had, an L-shaped split level in a subdivision built on land that had once been a dairy farm and where, on warm summer days, one could still taste cows on the wind. <laughs> Mary's mother, Gretchen, was working in her garden when they arrived and greeted them in the driveway. She was a handsome woman with long silver hair drawn back into a thick ponytail and a serious Methodist, though she rarely spoke of this. Come here, children. She pulled Mary and O'Neill into a simultaneous embrace. Engaged, you've made me so happy. I told them about Hilda, Lars said, lifting O'Neill's and Mary's bags from the trunk of the Taurus. That poor woman, Gretchen said, releasing them. She shook her head mournfully. I guess you've arrived just a little too late to say goodbye. She certainly lived a life, though. After lunch, Mary and O'Neill took their bag downstairs to Mary's old bedroom. Not much had changed in the ten years since Mary had moved away to college. The walls were still painted a dusty pink, the color a teenage girl might choose, and the shelves held high school textbooks of late 1970s vintage, Algebra Challenge, The Story of America, Human Reproduction. Above the bed, a waterbed, hung a curling poster of a, kitchen, of a kitten clinging to a branch. The caption read, of course, hold on, baby, Friday's coming. <laughs> you know, Mary warned, there's going to be a party or something Saturday night for our engagement. Is this bad, O'Neill asked. Mary shrugged and stuffed a handful of underpants and bras into the tiny bureau. It might be a little embarrassing. 
Don't you think it's odd having a party with everything else that's going on? O'Neill asked. Of course I think it's odd. Mary paused. But the thing is, no one else will. <laughs> O'Neill took the copy of Human Reproduction from its place on the shelves and opened it to a picture of a couple holding hands on a couch. The man had a beard and wore a, beard, a beaded necklace. The woman was pregnant. The words on the page spoke about the importance of communication between a couple. In the margins, Mary had written, shave your beard. <laughs> O'Neill returned the book to its place on the shelves and looked up at the poster over the bed. I like that kitten, he said. I was a clever girl. O'Neill sat on the waterbed, which undulated soothingly beneath him. His mind drifted a moment. He shifted his weight on the bed to see what it would do. A moment passed, and he removed his glasses and placed them on the windowsill. I was thinking, O'Neill began. I knew you would be, Mary said. <laughs> she looked at him with amused pity. Through the thin ceiling, O'Neill could hear, could hear Mary's parents padding heavily around the living room. Maybe you should stand, she said. <laughs> O'Neill had not loved Mary first, though he did want something. O'Neill had been teaching at William Penn Academy two years when Mary was hired, and they met at a faculty workshop at the start of the academic year. During the morning session, Mary sat across from him at a long table in the dining hall. It was a sweltering August day, and Mary was dressed for the heat in a pale blue cotton sundress with spaghetti, with spaghetti straps. O'Neill had a weakness for sundresses with spaghetti straps. <laughs> At a critical juncture of his romantic education, this costume had proved to be an encouraging one. <laughs> and for the rest of the session, his mind drifted in and out of this erotic memory while he watched Mary truck, tuck strands of straw-colored hair behind her ears and nod attentive, attentively at the remarks of the headmaster and the chairs of the various departments, things that O'Neill had heard a thousand times before. He had reached the stage of life when it had begun to make sense to check for a wedding ring, but Mary wore no jewelry at all, not even a watch, and this, too, seemed a good omen for O'Neill. <laughs> O'Neill made his move a month later on an October afternoon. He was familiar with the courtship rituals of his generation and had prepared for this day in the usual ways offering a smile when he saw her in the lunch hall or the faculty workroom, inquiring about her classes and students when the chance presented itself, once sitting beside her in a Friday afternoon meeting. They talked some about the usual things. He did not know if she had a boyfriend, but this was always a risk. That they were the only teachers on the upper school faculty under 30 years of age was a statistical reality that surely she had noted as well. In any event, some groundwork had been laid. The moment to act appeared at the end of a school day when O'Neill spied Mary alone in the parking lot beside her car, a rusty Toyota that seemed at once charming and pathetic. <laughs> Standing in a halo of autumn sunshine, Mary was holding her car door open with one hand and negotiating a pile of heavy books in the other. O'Neill had heard she was working on her PhD, and he had, as he made his approach, he thought of asking her more about this on a date. But when he told her he thought they might go out sometime, Mary said, Oh, really? <laughs> O'Neill waited for more, but there was none. And her look told him she thought the idea was hilarious, or else he would have to work much harder. She seemed almost to be laughing at him. It was true that his overture might have come off as clumsy and premature, and yet there was no reason to be rude. <laughs> This, of course, was a misunderstanding of the most fundamental kind, but for the time being, O'Neill was nonplussed and let the matter drop. Then, as can happen, they found themselves dancing together at a holiday party at the end of the term, and later that evening in Mary's car, kissing. O'Neill attributed this unexpected turn to the influence of the headmaster's world-famous Jamaican eggnog punch, <laughs> but two days later, Mary telephoned him from Minneapolis to say that, indeed, she really liked him more than she'd liked any man in quite a while, and she was glad he'd taken the trouble to find this out. I'm sorry about before in the parking lot, she said. That's just how I do things. <laughs> O'Neill picked her up at the airport on New Year's Eve, and they kissed again in the terminal, 
And by the time the new semester started, everyone at school seemed to know they were a couple. Now, two years later, they were engaged and waiting for Hilda to die. <laughs> to bide their time the afternoon of their arrival, Mary helped her mother with the strawberries while O'Neill and Lars assembled the new gas grill that Lars had bought for the engagement party. Their progress was hampered by the directions which were written in an improvised English full of cryptic lyrical urgency. <laughs> Twisting many screw by base, put tube under slot, 16 screw in all told. <laughs> And by now, turn gas valve into left mannerism with smooth, gentle motion. <laughs> they had been working two hours when Mary's older brother, Mark, pulled up in his truck. Lars showed his son the directions. Now, what do you make of that? Lars asked him and crumpled up the paper. I have nothing against these people, but you'd think they could hire somebody who spoke English to write the directions. <laughs> Mark took a beer from the garage refrigerator and knelt on the floor to examine the grill. Mark was a mystery to O'Neill. Though he always seemed to have plenty of money, he'd had dozens of completely unrelated jobs since college, lived alone in a rented townhouse three miles away from home, and never had a girlfriend anybody could remember. <laughs> None of this rang right to O'Neill. It was not a pattern of existence he recognized. And the natural assumption was that Mark was gay, or at least living some kind of secret life. But Mary insisted the opposite was true. It was possible, she explained, for some people, such as her older brother, not to have any secrets at all. <laughs> Mark sorted through the pile of parts and held up a pair of shiny aluminum tubes bent into a U. See these, he said? Spiders love to make nests in these. That doesn't sound promising, O'Neill said. <laughs> Mark pulled loose his tie. It's called a backflash. A backflash, Lars repeated gravely. Mark, wag Mark wagged his eyebrows, head for the hills if that happens. <laughs> for a while they watched Mark work, handing him tools when he asked for them, like nurses in an operating room. Hey, O'Neill, I heard you were going to marry my sister. O'Neill nodded and sipped his beer. Already he felt the first throb of a hangover, like a loose marble rolling around inside his head. The air of the garage was warm and dense. Well, you can have her, Mark said. <laughs> He looked up at O'Neill from the garage floor. Seriously, that's great news. I always thought you two would get around to it. That night they cooked bratwurst to try out the new grill, and after Mary's parents had gone to bed, Mary and O'Neill went out to the yard to lie in the hammock. O'Neill draped one foot over the edge and with his toe pushed the hammock to and fro. Cicadas buzzed in the leaves of the trees above them, a sound that seemed to come from the air itself. My mother wants to know if you believe in Jesus, Mary said. That was some talk you guys had. Mary adjusted herself in the hammock. I told her the jury was still out. Truthfully, I don't think she cares one way or the other so long as somebody finally makes an honest woman out of me. <laughs> to pass the time, and in the spirit of their trip, O'Neill asked Mary to tell him a story about her grandmother. The story she selected was not, as he might have expected, about some small tenderness or generosity passed between the generations, but came from a time long ago, right after the First World War, in the town of Pumpkin Center, South Dakota, when Hilda was just 16. Hilda had always been a big girl, Mary explained. To win a bet, she had once allowed herself to be weighed at a county fair on a scale used for beef cattle. <laughs> But at the time Mary was speaking of, she had really hit her stride. 250, 275, 300 was not out of the question. This on a woman not taller than five foot three. In another life, she, in another life, she would have been a size four and probably not bad looking at all. It was autumn, Mary said, and the town of Pumpkin Center had some kind of dance, a pumpkin dance. <laughs> Think of a barn, Mary said, as if O'Neill had never really seen one and square dancing, but not done by children for fun at school. These were adults. <laughs> so Hilda arrives at the dance, Mary said, and just then, inside the building, a fight is breaking out. A few bad words, some shoving, things get ugly fast. These were tough people, and a fight was a fight. One of the guys pulls a knife. This part is hearsay, but it makes sense when you think about it. In any event, the other guy sees the knife and takes off running for his life, turns the corner, and runs smack into Hilda. He's actually knocked flat, out like a light. Mary paused at this moment for effect. That was Herman, O'Neill said, understanding. Herman Olson, your grandfather. 
Actually, no, Mary went on. Herman was the guy with the knife. <laughs> they got to talking afterward. Hilda always said she should have known right then what a bastard he would turn out to be. <laughs> but what was a 300-pound girl supposed to do for her husband? Pumpkin Center was not exactly a hotbed of options. O'Neill considered the story he had just been told. Under the circumstances, Mary's meaning was plain. Okay, point taken, O'Neill said. No knives. Also, and for the record, let me just say you've really kept your figure and don't think I haven't noticed. <laughs> Good boy, Mary said. <laughs> Earlier that spring, before he and Mary flew together to Minnesota, O'Neill had witnessed an accident. This occurred, at a this, this occurred at a little after 8.30 on a Thursday morning, a day and hour when O'Neill should have been commencing his lessons for the day. Instead, he was reporting for jury duty, a civic obligation he looked forward to as it freed him from teaching while also amplifying the sensation newly felt in every corner of his life that he was departing the provisional maturity of his 20s for a genuine adulthood. The case he had been assigned was dental malpractice. <laughs> a young man and his parents were suing the boy's dentist for failing to extract a pair of baby teeth that had been retained. Much of the testimony was dully technical. It was a trial about teeth. Yet O'Neill found himself intrigued by the questions it raised of culpability and consequence. Was the boy's circumstance the foreseeable outcome of professional negligence or just his rotten luck? Would the boy still have had to endure a mouthful of braces in the commensurate social penalty no matter what the dentist had done? Three days into the trial, O'Neill ascertained from their murmurs of pity and sympathetic body language that his fellow jurors were red hot to crucify the dentist, but O'Neill was not so sure. He felt sorry for the boy, a handsome kid whose suit was so new it rode across his shoulders like a bedsheet on a clothesline, but these sympathies were no less persuasive than his feelings for the dentist, a dowdy and beleaguered-looking woman who spent her life prowling the damp and dirty precincts of other people's mouths and was now being asked to defend her every move. It was also true that the boy now had nice teeth, nicer than O'Neill's, or for that matter, anybody's on the jury. <laughs> Driving to City Hall, O'Neill was mulling these matters over when, from the window of his car, he spied a woman jogging with a baby stroller. The road he was driving was a busy two-lane boulevard that ran beside the Schuylkill River. Between the roadway and the river, there was a pathway for joggers and bicyclists. The morning air was cool and dry. The river shone with the good-natured and ancestral light of the old city, and the woman, in tights and a pink pullover, was moving along at a good clip while behind her, just beyond the circle of her awareness, two cyclists had slowed, waiting for a safe moment to pass. Driving at 50 miles an hour in a stream of traffic, O'Neill saw this arrangement of figures like pieces on a chessboard and knew at once what was about to happen. The woman would slow and turn to see who was behind her, and as she did, one of the cyclists would ram headlong into the stroller. It was inevitable. O'Neill would have stepped out of his body to warn the woman if he could, sent his mind through space to tell her. As he passed, the woman began her turn, and O'Neill saw in his rearview mirror the bike and stroller go flying and heard without hearing, for the windows were closed, no actual sound could reach him, their cries of alarm. The road was shoulderless, there was no way to stop or even slow his car, and even if he could have, what would he have done? He looked again into his mirror and saw the woman reaching for the stroller, but then the road curved and the image was lost. By the time he managed to turn his car around, the scene of the accident would be swarming with people many others had surely seen, and O'Neill would have nothing to offer but the useless observation that he had known the accident was going to happen but could do nothing to prevent it. That afternoon, the trial ended. The jury awarded the plaintiff $100,000 as casually as if they all had 10 times that much in their bank accounts, and O'Neill went home to marry. The image of the accident still pressed on him, but for some reason he did not speak of this. Like the speed with which he dissented to the jury's vengeful generosity, his role in this event seemed to be evidence of cowardice, though he could not say why this was so. There was, after all, nothing he could have done to alter the unfolding of events. Mary had picked up some dim sum on her way home from school, and they ate together at the kitchen table. O'Neill told her nothing about what he had seen from his car, nor about the trial. None of it. What did happen, as O'Neill was dipping a pork dumpling into a plastic container of soy ginger sauce, was that he was suddenly overtaken by an emotion as powerful and strange as anything he had ever felt in his life. 
the feeling beyond words that everything in his life was connected to everything else. He wasn't just living his life, he was his life. And it was possible at certain moments to step outside of time and apprehend one's existence in its entirety, if only for an instant. This was the feeling he had tasted that morning when he had seen the accident in his mind before it had actually occurred. And he also understood, even as this new awareness seemed to push all others aside, that he had had such thoughts before. They visited him from time to time, faded as quickly as they arrived, and could not be remembered. Soon, in the next instant perhaps, he would lift his chopsticks to place a salty nugget of noodle and pork on his tongue, and Mary's blue eyes would meet his, asking, O'Neill, what is it? And he would shake his head and say, nothing, and it would be nothing. Simply by saying so, the feeling would be gone. He wanted to do something to acknowledge it, even as he knew he would have no memory of his motive for doing this. So he excused himself from the table and went into the bedroom. For many years, since the accident that had killed his parents, they had visited him at college and on the return trip had lost control of their car in a snowstorm and plunged a hundred feet into a river gorge. He had kept his mother's engagement ring in a small jewelry box on his bureau with his father's cufflinks and gold money clip and a few odds and ends of his own. He hadn't so much as thought of this ring in almost a decade, but there it was, and that was how he and Mary had come to be engaged. The party was held Saturday afternoon under a tent that appeared without warning in the sloping yard behind the house. Mark arrived early to help with the grill, followed by Mary's sister Cheryl, who worked in a hair salon and sold beauty products on the side. O'Neill had met Cheryl only twice, but each time she had looked completely different. This time her hair was bleached a white blonde, the color of bones in the desert, and she was wearing makeup so heavy it looked like wet oil paint. The impression was cheaply dramatic, but O'Neill knew this was not the whole story. Cheryl was, as Mary said, a very churchy girl. She sang in the choir, made hot dishes for all the potlucks, and dated only men whom she described as solid specimens of masculine Christianity. <laughs> as more guests arrived, the two sisters sat at a picnic table and talked about the house Mary and O'Neill were hoping to buy, while Mark and O'Neill worked the grill, making hot dogs and hamburgers. Aunt Alfreda, Uncle Otomar, Alvin and Harriet and all the rest, O'Neill knew almost no one had never known anybody by these names. They shook his hand with bone-crunching force, or else not at all, and soon the conversation would die and they would leave him at the grill. Many of the guests brought envelopes of cash, which they handed with humble ceremony to Mary, who deposited them unopened in a wicker basket on one of the picnic tables. Like that scene in The Godfather, Mark said, watching this and flipping burgers in the dense smoke. The meat was fatty and flames shot up and around the spatula. Don't count your chickens, O'Neill. Those are some mighty cheap people you're looking at. <laughs> when this is all done, we can smoke a joint if you want. O'Neill didn't want to, but to say no seemed rude. After they had laid a fresh batch of burgers on the grill, Mark took him to the garage and lit a small roach. Are you sure people won't smell it? O'Neill asked. Mark laughed and handed the roach to O'Neill. It was so small that their thumbs bumped. With all that greasy smoke? They passed it back and forth until they could hold it no more. It was true. All O'Neill could smell was cooking meat. O'Neill hadn't smoked pot in years and years, and he felt nothing except perhaps for a slight sensation of buoyancy, as if his center of gravity had been elevated three inches. The rafters of the garage held old bicycles, O'Neill noticed. Half a dozen of them hung upside down from their wheels. He was tipping his head to have a better look when Mary appeared in the garage. Getting acquainted, I see, she said. Mark secreted the roach into his shirt pocket and, shirt pocket and winked at O'Neill. I was just telling O'Neill here what a great gal he was getting. Nevertheless, Mary said, the grill is on fire. <laughs> this proved an exaggeration. They had forgotten the burgers, which had burned. Still, with all the smoke and flames, Mary's mistake was a natural one. When they arrived at the scene, Lars was about to pour his beer into the grill, but Mark took the beer gently from his hand and closed the lid. 
When all the guests had left, Mary and O'Neill went to the, her bedroom to count their take from the party. Mark was right. Most of the envelopes contained just 10 or $20. Mary made a list of who had given what to write thank you notes later, and when this was done, they drove with Cheryl to the hospital. Hilda's bed was up high so that the nurses and doctors could attend to her easily. She had an IV and a nasogastric feeding tube and some wires that snaked under her gown to monitor her heart rate and respiration, but otherwise she looked as if she might be sleeping. Age and time had done its work. Under the thin hospital blanket, she looked no bigger than a 10-year-old. Her face was relaxed and her frail form moved gently with her unhurried breathing. Cheryl brushed Hilda's shock of white hair while Mary sat on the edge of the bed and told her about the party and who was there. She told her that she and O'Neill were going to be married in a year and about her job at the academy and the house they hoped to buy and how very happy she was. You'd like O'Neill, she said, as if he weren't there in the room with them and went on to say that he was a good teacher, kind and fair, that he wrote a funny poem to her each Christmas and that he would be a good father to her, their children when that day came. Cheryl had brought a nail kit and the two women gave Hilda a manicure, sanding the ends of her nails and painting them with pink polish. When they were finished, they took small balls of cotton between her old yellow toes and gave her a pedicure as well. On Hilda's chart, which hung from a hook at the end of her bed, O'Neill saw a red sticker with three letters, D and R. Out in the parking lot, Cheryl lifted her eyes to the summer sky. She's got nice color, at least, she said, don't you think? I think her life is very hard, Mary said. Hilda did not die. And after two more days of waiting, Mary and O'Neill arranged to borrow Mark's car, a Pontiac Grand Am he kept neat as a pin, to drive four hours north to Lake Superior. They had no destination in mind and settled on Grand Marais, near the Canadian border. They arrived in the evening and discovered that despite the stateliness of its name, the town had the contingent appearance of a frontier outpost. Most of the buildings needed paint and seemed to lean backward, away from the bitter winds of winter. The air was cold and still and smelled of iron. Before them, the lake reclined in a gray bulk like a lawn of stone. They checked into the town's one hotel, and in bed in their small room, Mary told O'Neill famous, famous tales about the lake, the ore ships and trawlers swallowed whole by violent winter storms that whipped up from nowhere, smashing men and rope and steel like the fist of God itself. They littered the bottom by the hundreds. The lake was so cold, she explained, that it acted as a preservative, sealing away the bodies of drowned sailors like a giant refrigerator. There was also something about the lake's acidity, she said, or else it was the other way around, no acid at all. Either way, the bodies were there. Is this your idea of pillow talk, O'Neill asked? <laughs> These are the stories of my tribe, Mary said. <laughs> Take it or leave it. <laughs> they awoke early the next morning to bright sunshine and a sense that their journey had not ended. Mary telephoned her parents to see if there was any news about Hilda. Her father answered and reported that Hilda's condition was unchanged, and after breakfast they packed up Mark's car again and continued on their way. O'Neill had also called the realtor in Philadelphia to see if there was any reply to their offer on the house, but she was out for the day, and he left a message on her voicemail. It was entirely possible he realized that their offer was simply too low to be taken seriously, and they would hear nothing at all. Under this spell of inconclusiveness, they drove three more hours north on a two-lane road surrounded by dense pine forests, crossed the border into Canada, and made their way to the city of Thunder Bay. Grand Marais had taught them not to expect too much on the basis of a name, and yet the sound of it when they read it on the map was attractive. They arrived at lunchtime and drove around the city, which was so ugly it was almost funny. There was no real downtown to speak of, just a collection of stern, concrete buildings with tiny windows, surrounded by neighborhoods of battered houses with railroad tracks cutting through the weedy yards. The land was very flat and a stiff wind blew. To the east, where the lake was, Huge smokestacks smeared the air with soot. This is the worst city I've ever laid eyes on, Mary said. I will point out that this is technically the South, O'Neill said. This is the Florida of Canada. <laughs> they searched in vain for a nice restaurant and finally gave up and ate greasy fish and chips at a fast food joint called Mr. Sandwich. 
It was obviously part of a chain, yet O'Neill couldn't believe there were even two of them. <laughs> Defeated, they drove back to the border. The sight of the customs station, with its crisply flapping flags and multilingual signs of welcome, filled O'Neill's heart with the relief of homecoming. They waited in line behind a tractor trailer with Saskatchewan plates and then pulled up to the booth where a border guard waited with a clipboard. Afternoon, folks. He leaned down to the window, a well-built man of about 40 with a very tight uniform and a waxy complexion. When he spoke, he filled O'Neill's face with the smell of mouthwash. Anything to declare? It wasn't very nice, Mary said. <laughs> The border guard rolled his, rise rolled his eyes around the interior of the Grand Am, then moved away, mumbling into a microphone clipped to his shoulder. A long moment passed, then he stepped back. Would you folks mind getting out of the car? You're kidding, O'Neill said. A second guard appeared and stood in front of the car with his hand on his holster. O'Neill was still looking at this when the first guard opened his door. The engine, sir? I'm from here, Mary said. I'm from Minnesota. Nobody's saying that's not so, the guard said. In the, in the station office, the guard had them empty their pockets and remove their personal effects. He questioned them about their travels, then took them to another room, windowless, where they were instructed to remain. The room held nothing but a coffee urn, some plastic outdoor furniture, a threadbare sofa, and a pair of video cameras that watched them from the corners of the ceiling. Not quite a jail cell, but at the very least a room designed to inspire confessions. Yoo-hoo, Mary said, waving her fingers at the camera. <laughs> she turned to O'Neill. You know, it's always the intellectuals they round up first. <laughs> I told you not to teach Catcher in the Rye, but did you listen? <laughs> O'Neill got himself a cup of coffee from the urn, sniffed it, and tossed it in the trash. It may be a little late to ask this, he said quietly, but how well do you really know Mark? <laughs> Mary frowned. Mark who? <laughs> a different guard entered, made a cup of coffee without looking at them, and stepped from the room. The door made an authoritative click as it sealed behind him. What I mean is, O'Neill said and lowered his voice again, there wouldn't be much of anything in the car, would there? <laughs> this is an interesting way to learn about a person, Mary said. <laughs> An hour passed, and then another. Guards came and went, filling their coffee cups and ignoring their questions. By this time, their situation was no longer funny in the least, and it was clear that they had fa found, or hoped to find, something in Mark's grand am. At last, the first guard entered the room and took a chair across from them. His expression was one of seriousness that barely concealed his happiness. <laughs> he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small plastic baggie. In the bag, O'Neill saw, were three joints and a pack of zigzag rolling papers. This was more or less what he had expected. <laughs> okay, so you found some pot, I guess, O'Neill heard himself say. Where was it? You tell me, Mr. Burke. <laughs> we want a lawyer, Mary said. She pointed at the bag. That's not ours. We're not saying anything else. <laughs> Who's then, the guard said. This Mark Olson you say is your brother? My grandmother is dying, Mary said. She had begun to cry. She's dying in the hospital. We have a bid in on a house. It's not even our car. The guard lifted himself in his chair to look theatrically around the room. Somebody explain to me why you would drive to Canada for two hours when your beloved grandmother is dying in the hospital. <laughs> Are you arresting us, O'Neill asked. This is my station, the guard said. I'll be the one to say what does or does not happen. <clears throat> Did you know, Mr. Burke, that a modern passenger car contains over 3,000 locations where a person can, find, can hide contraband? You should see the shit some people pull. <laughs> We're high school teachers on vacation, O'Neill said. High school teachers, the guard repeated. First your grandmother is dying, now you're high school teachers. <laughs> Please, Mary said. All we wanted was to find a nice place for lunch. <laughs> he left them again and more time passed. A guard brought them dinner, bologna sandwiches in plastic triangles, and cans of store brand pop, though neither ate this convict's food. <laughs> with the video cameras watching them, even speaking was impossible, though when the guard left them with their dinner, Mary began to cry again, and O'Neill held her on the sofa. 
they were going to jail, O'Neill guessed, or something like jail. That they had done nothing to deserve such a fate no longer appeared relevant. It was simply in the cards. The clock on the wall said it was evening, but in the windowless room, the hours seemed to refer to some other place entirely. At last, the guard returned and asked O'Neill to accompany him alone. He led O'Neill down a long hall to a room with banquet tables on which O'Neill saw the contents of their suitcases disgorged, socks and underwear, pants and shirts, toiletries and books, all displayed with embarrassing frankness under the room's fluorescent lights. No obvious damage had been sustained, though their toothpaste, O'Neill noted, had been squeezed from its tubes. <laughs> the room looked out on a garage bay where the Grand Am was parked. The trunk and hood stood open, and a man in a brown jumpsuit was using a rubber mallet to bang the hubcaps back into place. From behind the glass, the blows of his mallet rang like soft chimes. You should see the look on your face, the guard said. He was sitting on the edge of a metal desk and drinking a can of orange soda. He drained the can in a long gulp and launched it over O'Neill's shoulder into the waste can. Two points, he said, and held his fingers up in a V. Fuck you, O'Neill thought. Fuck you forever. <laughs> okay, what now, O'Neill said. What now is we see what we can do about getting you folks on your merry way. The guard paused to belch then took a clipboard off the desk and handed it to O'Neill. Here, look, over, look all this stuff over and sign where it says. The clipboard held a statement saying that everything had been returned to them. That's it? O'Neill asked. The guard shrugged and belched again. What did you expect? Mostly we're interested in guns and cigarettes around here. Three joints is barely worth the paperwork. What if it's not all here, O'Neill asked. Notice I said barely worth. <laughs> O'Neill set about repacking the contents of their suitcases. Missing, of course, was the money from their engagement party. O'Neill had hidden this, a little over $600, in an envelope in his toilet kit. Gone as well was Mary's engagement ring, which they had asked her to remove in the office when they'd emptied their pockets. They had placed these items into the same kind of little plastic, ba plastic basket used to serve bread in restaurants. The basket was there on the table with O'Neill's wallet and wristwatch and a couple of dollars in change, but not the ring. O'Neill understood he was faced at this moment with a choice, an important choice, but when he thought of Mary alone in the windowless room waiting for him, the answer was obvious. O'Neill took the pen and signed the form. Between us, I was a little disappointed, the guard said. You people had pay dirt written all over you. <laughs> O'Neill returned the pen and clipboard. Just one question. You do this all the time, you smug prick? The guard clicked the pen and slid it into his breast pocket. You have a pleasant day now, the guard said. After they were released, they drove straight south through the night to Mary's parents' house. Mark's car smelled like pine air freshener, but otherwise gave no evidence that it had been searched. They arrived in the very early morning, slept two hours outside the house in the parked Grand Am, and when the sun rose, Mary, who had either lost or forgotten her key, knocked on the door. When they realized no one was home, they continued on to the hospital. But Hilda's room was empty, the bed stripped and remade. Mary's family was nowhere to be seen. A nurse's aide in a pink uniform was boxing up the flowers and setting the room to rights. Mrs. Olson had died in the night, she reported, they had just missed Mary's family, who had gone for breakfast. You can probably still see her if you want, the aide said. Mary said she wanted to. The aide gave them directions, and Mary and O'Neill rode an elevator three floors down to the basement. The doors opened on a long hallway in the smell of alcohol. They followed the hallway as they had been instructed until they turned a corner and saw gurneys lined against the walls, four of them each bearing a body covered by a sheet. The body closest to them was Hilda. Her feet were exposed, showing her polished toenails. At the end of the hallway was a pair of swinging doors and a sign, pathology. Mary slumped against the wall. I just can't, she groaned. You'll be sorry if you don't. O'Neill had been in, th in such a place once before and failed this test. Either way, I'll be sorry, Mary said, her voice caught in her throat. Don't you know? I'm sorry all the time. Some metal folding chairs were stacked against the wall. O'Neill opened two so they could sit while Mary decided what to do. 
She sat with her back very straight and her eyes closed. I left them and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This was so. She had left them all behind. It was, he knew, the purpose of their journey, this goodbye. O'Neill rose and went to Hilda's gurney. Her linens were fresh, smelling of starch and laundry soap. A bit of her white hair peeked from underneath the sheet. From the contours of the sheet, O'Neill knew that Hilda was naked beneath it, naked at last. He took a corner of the cloth in his hand and lifted it from her sleeping face. He said, come see. <laughs> <laughs>